now day Spread a little aloha around the world And breakfast with Bob Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome back, everybody, to Breakfast with Bob, our Not Quite Kona edition. We are brought to you by Master Spas. As fuels go longer, Hoka Let's Fly, Form Smart Swim Goggles, DeBoer Wetsuits, Quintana Roo, Zoot, the original triathlon brand, Premium Plus Sports, and, of course, our Challenged Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, longtime friend, more importantly, Dr. Ken Roth, uh, is he lives what he preaches. He's, he's a guy who's run forever. And as, as, as somebody I want to chat with about what's going on with endurance athletes and heart issues. Dr. Roth, how are you doing, bud? I'm doing just fine today, Bobby. Thank you so much. And, and thank you so much for what you do with the challenged athletes. I just am uh, completely in awe for all that you've done in uh, giving, giving back to the community. So thank you so much. You are very welcome. So let's talk a little bit about your running background. Did you run through high school, college, all that? Well, back in high school, I was a 120 high hurdler, short guy trying to get over some hurdles. And uh, when I went to college, I was kind of focused on getting into medical school. So I put down the running for a couple of years. Uh, but when I got into medical school, I was more focused on my health and uh, studying all the time, being cooped up in libraries, uh, I knew was not a healthy lifestyle for me. Uh, I came from a family that had a pretty strong family history of heart disease and diabetes. Uh, obesity as well. So I knew that if I didn't do something different, uh, particularly during those college years, uh, medical school years, I was probably going to go down the road of my family. So way back when I started setting goals, uh, of course, running my first 10K, uh, then running a good 10K, uh, then trying to run a half marathon, a good half marathon, and finally with the goal of running a marathon. And uh, lofty goals back in the early 1980s, I wanted to do the Boston Marathon. And I uh, was fortunate enough, my first Skylon Marathon, which was in Buffalo, New York, where I was in medical school, uh, was able to uh, qualify for Boston. And uh, I think it was 1981 or 82, I did my first uh, of four Boston Marathons. So uh, most physicians at that time were running as back of the Packers. Uh, but I had qualified with a uh, 2.45 marathon time. So I was running with the, the, the big dogs and I was a physician uh, in the heat, of the heat of the pack. So it was uh, fortuitous. So. so when did you start your running streak? Because you ran forever and I was like 10 miles a day for X number of years. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just, uh, my personality type is if I'm going to do it, I need to do it every day. And uh, so I started uh, June of 1980. And during the first year, I missed four days of running. Uh, and again, the goal was to run Boston. So I wanted a 70 mile base per week. So 10 miles a day, seven days a week gave me 70 miles. I missed four days. And the last day I missed was uh, July 28th, 1981. So from July 28th, 1981, until I had my first knee surgery, uh, which was a, a left uh, uh, partial meniscectomy. That was June 1st, 20, uh, 2005. So it was just shy of 24 years. I had done 10 miles every day right up until that point in time that I had to have knee surgery. So what, what's fascinating is a, we get into running and triathlon for our health. And sometimes... <laughs> We go to the other extreme where all of a sudden this uh, what we think is healthy is not healthy. Yeah. Well, I think we all knew the risks orthopedically. I think most of us knew that uh, eventually we were going to have orthopedic problems. I don't know if you remember your younger days of running, but what kind of injuries did you have running? Uh, I had Achilles tendonitis. Yep. I had, you know, plantar fasciitis occasional uh, quadriceps or hamstring strains. I mean, we all knew that the orthopedic risks. Uh, but I think very few of us uh, thought much on the cardiac side. I think we all thought that we were doing our hearts good right. uh, by exercising regularly. So it's funny because I think we are the first generation. When I think about my parents, I, I don't think anybody, uh, our parents were out with a low, with a heart resting heart rate of the, in their forties and working out to the point of like 160, 170, 180 high end. So that sure. to me, I just wonder about the range. When I think about now, 
Dave Scott, John Howard, Greg Welch, Johnny G, who invented spinning. So many of, of people of my generation are having heart issues who have been longtime endurance athletes. And obviously way back, Jim Fix was the first guy, right? Who was like, oh my God, what a shock. This guy ran every day, he ran all these miles and passed away from, from uh, heart issues. Talk a little bit about why do you think this is happening? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right that this is a generational phenomenon. Uh, when I started in practice, I used to ask my patients, do you have a family history of heart disease? What were your parents' cholesterol numbers? Uh, we didn't used to monitor and be that acutely aware of our cardiac status uh, the last generation. Uh, I will tell you, when I first started my residency at UCSD for kicks, I did an EKG, and my EKG was read as very, very abnormal. I sat down with my professor, Kirk Peterson, was head of cardiology at uh, UCSD at the time, and he said, Ken, that's called a cardiac heart. You have cardiac heart syndrome. I am thin-chested. My heart was relatively big relative to my chest, and therefore my EKG which was compared to my baseline group, which was all veterans at the VA Medical Center in 1984. My EKG had many similarities to uh, the vets in 1984. So we are a new generation. We did things uh, kind of, you know, once the Iron Man came along and marathons became popular, uh, there were a lot more people like you and I who embraced exercise and took it to a whole new level. And you're absolutely right. Uh, people who had, I remember in my early years, most of the runners who came to see me had resting pulses in the 30s or the 40s, very, very low resting pulse. You just didn't see that back in the 50s and 60s. No. Just, that just didn't exist. So how are the medical science, how, how is medical science reacting to this and in, in figuring out, okay, what, what do we, do we tell people quit doing, just move more to moderation? Rather mm -hmm. than, okay, you, you think about back in the day, a Greg Welch would, would race Ironman events and long distance events during our summer. And then he'd go back to Australia and do high intensity, 20, 25 minute triathlons in his summer, in the Australian summer. So he was in 10 years, he was doing 20 seasons of racing. Yeah. And all of a sudden his heart is, is totally out of, out of kilter. What, what is, what's, is there a solution? Yeah. Well, I think, but Bobby, we have to separate coronary artery disease from cardiac arrhythmias and valvular heart disease. Okay. And I think most of us got into running knowing it would be relatively good for our overall health. What did we know back in the 70s and 80s? If you keep your lean body mass lower, usually better. If right. you're diabetic and you exercise regularly, usually your hemoglobin A1C is lower. If you have hypertension, and you create collateral blood flow by exercising regularly, your blood pressure is lower. So lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, and exercising regularly will lower your cholesterol, lower your blood sugar. Look, all of those things should have a positive cardiovascular effect. So in terms of coronary artery disease, which is the blockage of coronary arteries with atherosclerotic plaque, Exercise regularly should be very beneficial. What we didn't know back then was that all that exercise has resulted for some people in a screwed up electrical system of the heart. Yes. As a clinician, having taken care of many athletes for many, many years, these things are now coming to fruition where 60 and 70 year old athletes who've been working out for 40 years are coming in with atrial fibrillation with uh, sick sinus syndrome, which is a, a condition where your heart doesn't beat as fast as it should, uh, valvular heart disease, abnormalities of the heart valves. So these were unexpected consequences of very, very vigorous exercise. So uh, moving forward for our guys, like uh, most, I'm sure a lot of the guys who come in to see you, who you you ran with back with the B team and you know back in the day, a lot of those folks are coming in now with, hey, they really aren't running anymore, right? We, we the, the dead runner society, they're riding their bikes, they're doing other. The, we're addicted to exercise. That's what we do, right? So what is, what do you, what's your prognosis, not prognosis, but what do you prescribe for them in terms of 
hey, we know now that maybe there is, uh, you shouldn't be going, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be going with that. If you've got a low heart rate of 40, 45, 50, maybe you should be lowering the intensity of your hard workout so that you're not creating such a large range. Cause I think that that's a big issue. Sure. Sure. You know, I think the water's already under the bridge on that one. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head is that we're all cut from the same cloth. You know, you and I have a similar personality in the morning. We don't feel complete unless you've done your share of exercise. Right now, how you define that exercise will change as you get older, as your ability and your capacity to do exercise changes, you have to adjust to that. And that's one of the harder things. I see some 60 and 70 year olds still pushing real hard as if they were still 40, 45. And if you're not, you gotta listen to your body. But morphing or changing or finding other exercises that give you that same endorphin buzz is part of our personality. It's who we are, you know that. Exactly. So I know you've got into elliptigo, right? You're, you're able to still be outside. It's the running motion, but it's not the pounding because obviously. Now, what what injuries have you had to have you had to curtail your exercise? Obviously, your streak couldn't do that any longer. You right. I think you had a heart issue yourself. So talk a little about what you do now compared to what you did back then. Right. So I've morphed and changed. I, I love the. Uh... Elliptigos. I think uh, elliptigo allows you to continue to feel like you're running, you're standing upright, you're breathing. Uh, the VO2 max studies on elliptigo came out to you're doing about a 35% greater calorie burn than you would be if you were on a regular bicycle. Hmm. So uh, the weight of the uh, machine going up hills, dragging that up hills, it gives you a, a very nice calorie burn. Uh, I've morphed into doing ellipticals recumbent bike, Peloton, uh, elliptigo, swimming every day of the week. But I still have that desire every morning to wake up and do one of those things. I have to do one of them to feel, uh, get my heart rate up, break a sweat and, and feel like myself. Uh, but, you know, we all morph. Uh, we saw Bill Randall was doing stand up paddle ball. Uh, yes. board for a long time. He was really getting a, a nice, nice uh, endorphin rush out of that. I think many of us have found alternatives to the daily runs. I still see it's funny because I'm in the, for when I'm doing triathlons, I'm in the 70 to death category. So we got a lot of our, our older guys. And I was at a race up in Long Beach last year. And right before the start of the race, a guy in our way was jumping up and down. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm getting my pacemaker going. And <laughs> So people are adapting. It's not like they're going away from exercise because it's who we are and what we do, but they're finding ways to, like you said, you're doing elliptical, you're doing other things. Um, and But when somebody's getting a pacemaker or defibrillator, the, the recommendation is obviously you do less, but it's still okay. I mean, you, you can't take exercise out of a lot of people's lives. Right. Now the pacemakers are set for a basal rate. So Usually, if your heart rate gets too slow, remember that bradycardia that we were all awfully proud of when we were 40? Yes. Uh, when you're 70 and your heart rate's in the 30s, you don't have enough power. Think of your heart as an engine. If the engine is just moving that slowly, you're not circulating, getting the circulation to your whole body. So the pacemaker can be set to your friend who is starting in the starting line. He should just reprogram the defibrillator to up the gain so that he doesn't get to 60, that he sets it at 70 or 80. Um, as you know, as you get older, your ability to achieve higher heart rates goes down. That's just right. part of the aging process. So you're never going to have a heart rate of 160 or 170 when you're in your 70s. It's, right. it's just so. Uh, but the question is the lower side of the heart rate. You don't want it too low either. It's it's funny because it's it's a uh, it gets we think we're doing the right thing, we always think we're doing the right thing. Exercise, exercise, more is better. Half Ironman is great. Full Ironman is better. Uh, are you seeing more and more of, the, of your patients just having to deal with uh, having to deal with the fact that you know I just can't do any I can't do what I love to do anymore. And how do they handle? It? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we make referrals to psychiatrists. Uh, you know, people go through depression 
Uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, when you lower uh, endorphin levels, there is some depression associated with it. Uh, your body goes through a metamorphosis. Your body changes when if you're, you and, and we saw that with the triathletes who used to take a season off. Typically, they would gain weight when they took the time off instead of losing weight because their bodies were catching up to over exercising. You know, adjusting to change isn't easy. And it's particularly difficult for people who are very set in their ways and have done things for a long period of time. But a, a lot of uh, older athletes are uh, meeting the day of reckoning uh, where they have to find another uh, way to feel good about themselves. When you talk over exercising, I remember what my radio co-host, Paul Huddle, he did, you know, they had this Ironman World Series thing and he was doing, you know, five Ironmans plus a lot of other races every single year. When he retired, he, he was telling me that he basically slept for, he felt like it was the just all of a sudden he was just tired all the time. Yeah. He, while he was in the midst of racing as a pro, he really couldn't take any time off. But all of a sudden when he was done, he was just fatigued. He felt it was like for years, body just catching up with that, with that fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, is that pretty common? Is that something you see? Yeah, I mean, your body will recycle itself. You know, what we've become expert at is ignoring the signs that our body gives us. What did you do when you trained? When it hurt, you went harder. If you were short of breath, you went harder. You constantly overcame certain signals your body was giving you. I think we have to, as aging athletes, learn to listen to our body. I think uh, your body is telling you something for a reason. If, if Paul needed more sleep, uh, his body was telling him it's time to reset. It's time to recycle. And you have to listen to your body. The other issue is sometimes valvular heart disease. And because our, our hearts have been so hyperdynamic for so long, sometimes the valves uh, ha either sustain wear and tear or at times can get infected. Uh, people who exercise vigorously when they have fevers uh, can sometimes infect their heart valves. And I have seen quite a bit of valvular heart disease in people who were former athletes. Uh, when the issue that you had, I mean, obviously you, you work in the medical profession and you, I'm sure, like a lot of us feel you're immune. Yeah. Uh, your heart issue, how did you deal with it? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what happened that day. Um, I had a syncopal event. So I got up, uh, was, was working outside on a warm day, stood up quickly, and I passed out. And I think uh, I had been doing a lot more cycling. So my quadriceps had gotten bigger. My resting pulse is still relatively low. And when I stood up, uh, I think my brain just didn't perfuse because my heart rate is trained not to increase quick enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I, uh, I, I had the syncopal event. And when I fell, I hit my head and I had a, a skull fracture with a, a brain hemorrhage. So I was just fortunate. My wife found me and brought me to the hospital and uh, they patched me back up again. But uh, dehydration or hypotension uh, is not uncommon in, in athletes and particularly as you go, get older, the bottom line, Bobby, is hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You have to make sure you're well hydrated, particularly as we get older. That was my takeaway. When you look back at your running career, uh, do you look at back and go, okay, this is what I would do differently. These are the yeah. mistakes I made uh, during the streak and also just, just your running career overall. What mistakes did you make? Yeah, I don't know if I could have changed my mindset. Um I think at the end of the day, I wore my body out. Uh, I left a lot of great miles behind me, uh, but now I'm coming up on age 68. And the question is, what do I have left to work with? And we talk about that morphing, you know, different parts of the body hurt. Uh, they've been worn down. And uh, if I didn't wear out, uh, you know, 100 and plus thousand miles on my joints, uh, I might've been better preserved to enjoy my, my older age, uh, maybe more comfortably. But uh, I, I knew I was doing it when I was doing it, uh, you know, it's mind over matter. And unfortunately, I, I let my mind get away with me. All you there are so many guys who would do the every weekend, the Sunday run on concrete around Mission Bay, 20 yeah. mile run. And a lot of those guys aren't running anymore. Right. Most sure. most of them aren't running anymore. How have 
how has the equipment changed? How has the sport changed where it, it could be people can actually run longer or run and stay in the game longer? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned also the boardwalk and the hard concrete. You know, we're very fortunate in San Diego County, an ideal place for training. You got to get out on the trails. You got to do the softer stuff. I mean, if you want to keep your joints yes. intact, yeah. less, less concrete, the better. And all the shoe companies, you look at what they've done, you know, to make up for different people's gates, pronation, supination, uh, more padding. You know, we always thought lighter shoes were better because we're going to go faster. Uh, they have uh, so many protective devices uh, built into the shoes these days. I think the technology, you know, just like skiing technology, you look at the new skis, they, they cut so much different than they did years ago. All the new uh, running shoes, I think, are much, much better equipped to help runners avoid orthopedic injury. I think the industry has put a lot of uh, focus on yeah. that. Well, yeah, one of the things I always pushed was I, trying to get runners to convert to become triathletes. I would always tell them the orthopedic reality is when you become, when you turn 50, you're not running faster, right? Yeah. It, it, there, it's going to be a downward trend. But as a triathlete, I can be faster at 70 than I was at 60. I buy a better wetsuit. I ride ride harder or lighter bike, better wheels. Are you seeing runners that may be moving over and understanding cross training? Because back in the day, if you're a runner, you never went to the gym. And if yeah. you're a gym guy, you never ran. So oh, yeah. I think there's more of a, a people are understanding that cross training is a big savior for for people who want to be endurance athletes forever. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think if you go to the gym nowadays, you find a lot of ex runners. Yes. Uh, you go to a CrossFit classes, many ex runners. You go to yoga and Pilates classes. It's all ex runners. So we, we're all cut from the same cloth. It's it's a health and body wellness mindset. And wherever we fit in as we get older, that's that's kind of where we're going to go. Uh, I was never a cyclist. And now I'm doing, you know, the uh, elliptigo and I do a Peloton regularly. You wouldn't have caught me dead on a bike, you know, 30 years ago. And now two days a week, I'm pounding the Peloton. So I got to do something. Is a weight training for for aging athletes? Is that something you recommend? Probably not a bad idea. The more important thing is really flexibility. Uh, so it's strength and flexibility and keeping your core intact. So yes. anything you can do to improve your paraspinal muscles in your back and the core muscles in your abdomen, that core gives you the ability to uh, build, uh, create a good base. And that way you can continue to use your arms and legs for a long period of time. You know, as people get older, stability and decline uh, you see posture changes. Uh, a lot of things wear down. If your if your posture isn't good, uh, you're going to have a lot more orthopedic uh, issues. Any more? One of the things we love about endurance, obviously, is we get to test ourselves. We go and do races, and you did a lot of how many how many races do you think you did in your career? Oh, I was not a big racer. You know, I'm 30, 40. I mean, I did. Mostly 10Ks. That was my my main, you know, yeah. I was in the mid-30s for the 10K. Um, you know, I did only, what, eight marathons. I mean, well, I didn't smart. feel my start. For me, my run was the Sunday run. So being right. out with the guys and getting in a good training run, uh, that was that was my fastest day of the week. Monday was always a, a slow jog in the woods. Uh, so my, my weeks recycled themselves. So... Now being older, you know, I, I kind of have lost, I think, the competitive edge. You know, some little gal goes by me. I'm glad to let her go. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you just kind of have to let it go, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you, uh, you as we age, you, uh, you start rationalizing. As I'm running along, I'm going, you know, uh, 11 is a new eight. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I love it. It ain't easy getting older. That's what they say. So, nah, but still fun. It's still yeah. fun. There's, still, there's so many good options out there now. Like you said, you ride the Peloton, you got somebody telling you what to do, or you can do it on your own. There, there's so many, there really is no reason not to be fit. And, and, and we've all know that we don't see a lot of overweight 80 year olds. If you're, yeah. you, you, you've got to be lean. If you, if you, you know, you want to, you want to win at this game, you, you got to be lean. Right. 
So there's, uh, you know, I have a lot of older patients and the a, a difference between your chronological age and your physiological age is really remarkable. So your chronological age, if you're 80, you're 80 years old. But if your mind still perceives and when you shut your eyes and you still think like you're 65 and you can still perform like you're 65, you, you just live a lot longer because yes. people who fall and break their hips, people who get concussions or, or have intracranial bleeds, it's because of poor balance and poor musculoskeletal and cardiovascular health. And there's some people who are not chronologically old, but ha have poor constitution and they tend not to do well. When we put them in the hospital, they tend not to do very well. So, you know, that keeping that physiological age as low as you could uh, yes. will serve you well for your old age. Well, and I bet you when you were running, you liked it when you were running with a lot of the younger guys. <laughs> hanging out with younger people is a good way to stay young, too. For sure. Just mindset alone, never mind physiologically. So, yeah, you don't want to be that eighty-year-old guy checking the old bits every day with your with your other eighty-year-olds. You're hanging out with sixty-year-olds. You're going to go out and ride the bike. You can go play golf, do other stuff. Absolutely, love it, Doctor Roth. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's it's been fascinating just seeing how many folks have been dealing with heart issues. Who you know, you go, God, this is one of the fittest guys I've ever met, and you're going, <laughs> what what's going on? So it's it's. Yeah. Uh, I think the heart is confused, right? Uh, this is this is something that's never happened before. We're first we're the first generation of guinea pigs who've been doing all this cardiovascular stuff forever and ever and ever. So absolutely, it'll it's be been an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to care for our athletic community over the years and to be able to learn. I, I say I have as a primary care physician, I have a front row seat in the theater of life. I get to see what goes on behind before me, and I get to learn uh, from other people. So. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you today, Bobby. And it, as always, it's been uh, an absolute honor and a pleasure to have been your friend over these many years. And again, I'm in awe of all you've done uh, for the San Diego community. So oh, thank, thank you. you, Kenny. Dr. Ken Roth has been our guest again, everybody. Breakfast with Bob, our Not Quite Kona edition. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll Thanks. catch you next time. See ya. Bye-bye.